Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to Green Bank Community Zoom. I'm stepping in for Jim today, who's um, with the American Physical Society with Green Bank Observatory, uh, that we had a ceremony today, has been designated a historic site. So um, he's, he's with that group right now. Uh, just a quick um, update on the observatory news. Our summer maintenance season's coming to an end. In addition to the normal maintenance activities we've done, we've replaced uh, a significant section of concrete and grout underneath the track. Um, that concrete that is currently curing, um, and it could we could be returning to operations as early as Friday night. Um, they'll test it Friday afternoon. Does, they take samples when they cure it, they put it in off in little samples. So they'll stress test these little samples on Friday afternoon. So we won't know until Friday afternoon if we're good to go Friday night or not, um, but the schedule will be sent out and updates will be sent out accordingly. So all of our active users were sent email earlier in the day, sort of giving, a, giving them an update. So please get your um, observing scripts up and ready. Um, if you're an active observer, enable your projects in the DSS. And if we don't get going up on Friday evening, it, you know, they'll test it again. Um, and we could be going early next week at the latest is our current expectations. So we're excited to be up and running again. So we're looking forward to that. So please get your observing scripts in place. Okay, um, today we're fortunate that fortunate to have Dunk Lorimer from the University of, well, West Virginia University, and he's going to be talking about green bursts. Um, remind um, viewers, uh, we'll take questions in the Q&A box at the end. Hmm. So go ahead and take it away, Dunk. Okay, thanks very much, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for, uh, for hosting. Um, Yeah, so I thought I'd tell you uh, about an experiment um, that's been kind of in the uh, in my brain for you know about seven or eight years at this point. I think it started with um, a call for expressions of interest to the Green Bank community, um, uh, the middle of the last decade. Um, following some thoughts by Ron Madalena about um, basically taking a copy of the L-band feed. And so you're looking at that uh, there in the secondary um, focus. Um, that's the L-band receiver um, and uh, the, other, the other receivers on the turret there, as we all know and love them. But uh, um, the, um, the, the realization by Ron and, and others, I think, at the time was that even uh, even if uh, the L-band feed is not in the focal position, then it's still uh, um, the uh, the dish is still illuminate the, the the receiver is still illuminating the dish. No, the dish is still illuminating the receiver uh, at L-band, and so you're getting a fraction of the GBT always on sky. Um, and uh, there's potentially useful science to be done there, and so the observatory made available a copy of the L-band receiver so that in addition to a regular observer who would be taking data with the L-band receiver or one of the other receivers, then um, the um, um, other secondary scientists uh, like myself could uh, could use this copy uh, and do different um, um, science experiments with it. So one of the uh, experiments was uh, a SETI, um, project that Dan Wertheimer ran for a number of years. And another one was Greenburst, uh, which is a transient uh, detector, which is still running on the GBT as we speak, um, even, even when the telescope's not actually observing. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been up to and uh, what we'll be doing over the next few years. Um, this has been a fun little experiment that I've been uh, working on uh, with some really great uh, people. Um, the inset there is Myra Cernis. Uh, Myra was a postdoc here a few years ago, funded by an NSF uh, grant that we got for this project. Uh, on the right there is uh, Devansh Agarwal, a former PhD student at WVU, um, who did a lot of uh, excellent work to realize uh, this system. And then in the center there is Joseph Kania. Joseph is just about to defend his thesis um, 
and he's been working, among other things, on uh, Greenburst operations. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, to motivate uh, the, the rest of the discussion, um, primarily um, Greenburst was uh, designed to look for fast radio bursts, but it also uh, is great at detecting any type of dispersed transient that happens to be uh, seen by the L-band receiver. Um, but for fast radio bursts, there's a sort of fact sheet that I try to keep up to date here. Uh, I remind people who are less familiar than the current audience that this is the radio sky at Green Bank in the background, the five centimeter sky. And so just about everything you're looking at there is a galaxy. And um, these fast radio bursts uh, turn out to be a cosmological phenomenon. Um, they're bright sources. Um, some of them are a few Janskys. Um, they're observable across um, uh, a lot of the radio band up to a few gigahertz currently. Uh, they have this extraordinarily high all sky rate uh, of um, a thousand or so uh, going off uh, each day, which we'll, we'll get to uh, in this talk as well. Um, they're, they're isotropic on the sky. They're highly dispersed. So that the, uh, the frequency dispersion that you see for pulsars uh, and galactic sources uh, is much greater for FRBs. Um, and that's uh, allowing us to use them as probes of the intergalactic and medium and um, make statements about the, the sources um, in the host galaxies as well. Pulses are typically narrow. Um, a few milliseconds is fairly typical, although there are some at the long and short end of that. Uh, you can see that there's uh, over 700 now uh, published. Um, more will, um, will ultimately come from ongoing experiments uh, into the public domain, but that's the, the current set that you can play with. Um, about a tenth of those are known to repeat. Um, you know, that, that is, they've been seen more than once. Um, and um, about 40 right now have been localized well enough on the sky to um, be um, robustly identified with host galaxies whose redshifts you can measure. Redshifts go out to about 0.6, something like that. You can see in the inset there the, the number of FRBs versus time. Greenburst started uh, operations around 2019, um, and uh, there's a lot of activity. Um, this this climb here in the number of FRBs is um, um, mostly due to CHIME, um, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, which, uh, as you all know, there is a an outrigger station at the observatory right now. Uh, only one of these bursts uh, was found by Green Burst, so we haven't made a huge dent in the in the overall number, but we've done some interesting things along the way. Um, just to further orient you, um, you know, we're we're motivated in general in the in this sort of transient domain in the few millisecond region by the discovery of giant pulses from the Crab Nebula, which go back to its discovery um, at Green Bank um, in the late 60s. Um, where it was first at the, the 33 millisecond pulsar at the, the center of the, the Crab Nebula was first identified by its giant pulses that you can see here that are often tens to um, hundreds or even thousands of times the mean, um, the, the 33 millisecond periodicity is just buried in this, uh, this noisy data stream here. But you see these giant pulses, um, which implies that um, sources like the crab and perhaps even more energetic can be seen out to even greater distances, um, extra galactic distances. And so people have been thinking about this for a long time. Um, and uh, fast radio bursts, you know, came around, uh, you know, starting around 20 years ago. Um, a lot of the, um, the really interesting um, stuff in this sort of time domain area was dominated by pulsars in the 70s and 80s and 90s when people went away from pen charts to Fourier transforms to discover faint signals. Um, but around about the late 90s and um, David Nice did a survey at Arecibo and also this group here at Cornell, Jim, Mora and Xiaomi, who interestingly don't look too different uh, than they do today than they did uh, around 20 years ago. And the lab itself, I don't think it looks that much different. There's the picture of Babe Ruth, I think, is still there. Um, anyway, they were very interested in um, finding um, crab-like pulsars in other galaxies. 
uh, and developed a number of tools, um, just very simple tools to search for um, bright dispersed signals. We applied some of those techniques to um, some, some of the large um, quantity of data sets that were available at the time. There was a, in particular, there was a survey of the Magellanic Clouds with parks, and we were fortunate enough to see this, the prototype of a new population that we now call fast radio bursts here. And here's the, the dispersion effect that, uh, that I alluded to in the previous slide, um, where the uh, radio frequency, this in, in this case, it's an L-band observation with parks. You can see that the pulse is, the pulse is dispersed by a few hundred milliseconds uh, here due to its anomalously large dispersion measure. So of course, you know, we could we could go on for hours about um, what, what we know about fast radio bursts, but the point of this little update really here today is, to, is this is what's motivating us. Um, and uh, we're, uh, we're trying to, um, to learn more about them and, and make use of this additional telescope time with the GBT. Um, among the things that you can learn through through the discovery of fast radio bursts are the various contributions to the dispersion dispersion measure, which are shown in this, uh, these images here. You know where we're interested in FRBs in distant galaxies, which have contributions from the host itself and the source environment, uh, and then the the free electrons that they traverse through on their way to the Milky Way, which might they might hit um, galaxy halos and just the IGM itself. Um, they hit the Milky Way halo, our uh, ISM, uh, and even uh, a bit of the ionosphere um, before uh, the pulse arrives at the telescope. Uh, and the original pulse here, you can see it's uh, it's been dispersed by a number of different contributions. So there's a, lot, there's a ton of really interesting information that's encoded into these uh, FRBs that we want to, um, to learn more about. Um, and so just to get give you the, the, the brief summary of um, green bursts, you know, our sky coverage to date, um, we've been observing since uh, 2019. We've collected about, we've, about half of the time um, that's been available since then, we've collected use, uh, useful data. Um, and this, uh, this sky map, <laughs> what you're looking at here is in, in galactic coordinates, just summarizes the, the number of hours spent quantized into sort of six degree square hexagons um, just to give you a, an overall sense of our coverage. So we've, we've been covering the sky uh, as you might expect, um, slight preference towards the, uh, the galactic regions, but we, you know, we, have, we have coverage of um, pretty much all of the GBT sky in that time. Um, and that's just thanks to this, um, this, this wonderful opportunity that the observatory gave us um, and so what we do uh, with the with the data as it comes in is um, we we convert it into uh, what we call filter bank format which is um, a, a quantized version of the um, the frequency um, information across the receiver uh, as a function of time and we analyze the data in um, kind of nine minute um, chunks um, so they get saved to disk. Um, we we interface with the telescope um, um, to an extent where we know where the telescope's pointing, and um, we we know if the the receiver is in one of the one of the positions where it can see the sky, uh, and we can assess whether the, the data are, uh, are worth processing or not. Uh, if they are, we uh, we pass it to a tool that we called Heimdall, which is a community based resource. A lot of folks in the Pulsar and FRB community use it. It was developed in Australia to search for dispersed pulses. Uh, we, um, it's particularly well suited to, GP, to uh, GPUs. Um, so we do that and generate a number of candidates uh, and we form what we call these cutouts here that you can see in the bottom of the slide here. Here's a, you know, an observation of a bright pulsar that's seen by the system, and you see the pulse uh, clearly there, uh, resolved as a function of frequency. Um, we also um, show this this uh, image at the bottom here. You know, we call it the we call these the bow ties. Um, they um, it's and it's just it's just the way that you as you're searching through dispersion measure space, the pulses add up in such a way that they um, 
they maximize at the optimal DM uh, and fade away to higher and lower lower DMs. So we uh, we started doing this uh, this experiment and quickly got overwhelmed by all of these candidates. They were not just from interference, but also just from known pulsars. There were way more than we could we could keep up with. So one of the things that uh, Devanch um, and another one of our students uh, worked on here uh, is something called FETCH, um, which stands for Fast Extragalactic Transient Candidate Hunter or something like that. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a very uh, clever um, piece of software um, that uses convolutional neural networks uh, to um, that are trained specifically on the images here. So uh, we're, we're literally um, teaching um, the, um, the computer how to, how to search for these, um, these pulses um, by, by giving them lots and lots of examples from the 20 meter telescope, other pulses that we have from GBT and many other different telescopes. And so we've, uh, it's learned how to look for, for, for signals like this. And it can also uh, categorize RFI as well, which is really, really valuable. And so we end up with a, um, a set of uh, plots that are uh, a lot easier to manage uh, and, are, and we can routinely tag to, to known pulsars. And so we now have uh, thousands of, of pulses like this uh, in our database that are really quite nice, uh, just individual pulses from known pulsars um, that we're, we're currently um, working on and, and extracting um, distributions for um, for the population of pulsars that have just been observed as part of regular timing experiments. Um, so that's a very nice uh, side benefit um, to all of this. Uh, and then there are two discoveries that I just want to highlight before I close here that we've, uh, we were just about to publish. So this is hot off the press. Um, first is, is 0038 plus 54. It turns out to be a two second pulsar um, that was found uh, by Greenburst just as a single pulse during an RFI scan. Um, and uh, so there wasn't even a regular astronomical observation going on. We found this pulse that you can see there. It was, it was categorized and uh, quickly shown not to be coming from any uh, known uh, source in that area, uh, relatively bright. Uh, and within our nine minute uh, chunk, we were able to identify a number of fainter pulses that allowed us to identify the periodicity of this source. And it turns out to be a two second period. Here are some of the pulses from the original um, observation. Um, uh, we were, you know, the relevant piece of data was about uh, 60 seconds in duration where the, the source drifted through the beam. And so we were able to, uh, to identify it as a pulsar then. And um, it's not the type of thing that you would be able to, to use the GBT for routine follow-up um, because it's just a single long period pulsar, but it, we are, are now following it up with chime. We've been able to confirm it um, and, and uh, um, carrying out um, regular observations there. So that's uh, um, been a nice uh, unexpected discovery. Uh, I wasn't expecting to find just individual pulses uh, in the sky. Um, what we were what we were uh, really hoping to find were more of these things. Um, when we designed the experiment, we thought it might find about one FRB a month. Um, turns out it's about one FRB a year or two years, if you're lucky, the actual rate. Um, it's just not as high as we uh, the, as we originally thought. However, we have so far found one uh, really um, intriguing source, uh, and we're following it up right now. It turns out to be a narrow band um, FRB. Um, it's not seen in, across the whole of the um, the pass, but the 800 megahertz pass band that we have. That's similar to uh, what is known for a number of repeating FRBs. Um, it also, there, are, there are also the existence of multiple pulses um, that you can see here. There's a bright central component and then some flanking things, uh, features around there that possibly have a, a common um, periodicity that I've indicated there. Um, there's a limit to what we can do with this individual observation. So we're, uh, we're following it up right now um, with other telescopes. Um, but it certainly um, has all the hallmarks um, of um, what we might expect from um, an interesting repeating FRB. And so 
that uh, that came around last summer. Um, we've been able to update uh, our estimates of the or measurements, I guess, of the event rate of FRBs across the sky with this type of at this frequency with this type of sensitivity. Um, um, this is just a summary of what we find. This is the this is the distribution of the event rate. So it's about a thousand per day over the sky that we uh, that we infer from our survey and, and other ones at uh, this frequency. We can also look at what we call the source count in, index, which you can think of as the log n log s um, uh, exponent, um, which would be minus three halves for a Euclidean population of standard candles. What we find is something flatter than that. It's about minus point, uh, point 0.8. Um, and so our uh, our source count index uh, looks like this. Here's the Euclidean one there. Um, it, what we're seeing is actually more representative of something where you have a non-Euclidean distribution of um, sources with a luminosity distribution. And these two curves are showing some possible uh, ways you can do that. Um, under different assumptions. So um, that's quite a nice uh, additional benefit to all of these uh, all of these hours that we're looking at on the on the transient sky. Um, oh, the, the point here, though, is that with this revised rate, we're not going to find many more FRBs like this uh, in just through routine observations. And so in whatever time left we have on green bursts, you know, that we can afford to keep it running and, and fund students to do useful work. We're looking now at, at uh, different um, um, types of experiments. And so I, I just wanted to float one idea uh, here. <clears throat> uh, and that is to look, to use it to zoom in on um, likely areas of the sky where, where we might expect to find magnetar pulses. Um, and so this is motivated by the 2020 discovery of the uh, the bright burst from a, a galactic magnetar that I'm assuming everybody's familiar with. Um, that was seen by Chime and Stair 2, this really bright sort of Megajansky pulse that's um, been associated with uh, SGR 1935 plus 2154. And so it helps to make a connection between <coughs> FRBs and magnetars. And we thought we were motivated by this uh, at the time, and we used the 20 meter telescope at the observatory to look for um, similar sources that you m might expect in, in M82. Uh, so far, we've collected a month uh, of different epochs of uh, M82, of data from M82 using the 20 meter. We haven't seen any pulses. We would have expected to find found a few by now if the, the star formation rate relative to the Milky Way um, in M82 implied a larger population of magnetars. And so we're not, uh, we're able to kind of place limits on that right now. But I think one of the things that is quite interesting that we're looking into is looking at other nearby star bursts with green burst um, and taking advantage of its greater sensitivity um, if there is, uh, and seeing if, seeing if we can use that to constrain um, the event rate uh, of things like this in, in nearby um, galaxies. So that's that's an idea that we're pursuing. Um, and I'll just leave this up as my final slide here. Um, we're also thinking about, there's now, as I mentioned, over 60 uh, um, repeating sources. And I, and I think Greenburst has a useful role to play in uh, monitoring um, some of the less well-studied ones and looking for looking at some of the more prolific uh, repeating sources and characterizing their burst rate. It really just saves a lot of time by doing this whole automated process um, of the detection and analysis for you. As I mentioned, we have a, a really rich database of pulsar pulses, um, particularly for millisecond pulsars, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, and we're looking for ultra long period pulsars, I think motivated by the discovery of this two second pulse. And now um, there's been a number of other studies with diff other different telescopes. The current record holder is 76 seconds for the longest period pulsar but it was identified through its individual pulses. And I think, again, that's something that, that Greenburst can be more sensitive to um, uh, in the future. Um, we would love uh, interest in anyone thinking about wanting to clone our system to other uh, other telescopes. There's already a, a version that Devanch put on the, the Lovell telescope a few years ago. Um, 
maybe getting a copy to put on the 20 meter might be a fun a fun project. Um, looking at the ultra wideband feed and, and thinking about a um, a real time um, single pulse detection system for that would be would be pretty neat too. Um, other surprises ahead. I think it's always useful to um, to think about to try to anticipate things. Um, you know, we're we're heavily reliant on AI now to to do this experiment. We would just be overwhelmed with pulses, but we haven't really told it to sort of be more creative and and look for other types of pulses and in, in, uh, in in the data. And so, thinking about you know other other possible discoveries that could be made, um, you know, with a uh, a fast sample data set like the one we have, I think might be an interesting idea too. So I will leave it there. Hopefully this update has been something useful uh, and something that perhaps you haven't heard about. It's just an, it's just been an experiment that's been going in the background for a number of years. So thanks thanks for your time. Well, thank you, Duncan. Uh, okay, um, people go ahead and submit your questions if you have any questions for Duncan. Well, then we have our first question that came in. Um, do FRB estimated rates from the GBT observations correlate co with the chime observed events? I think yes. That I think if I understand the question correctly, you know, are, are the rates consistent from observatory to observatory? Uh, mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. When when we started out the experiment, the the all sky rate was something like ten to the four per day per sky, and now it's 10 to the three per day. And it's, pre it's been pretty much constant at that. Okay. Um, could the nanograv observations yield any bursts that might have been observed in their data? Um, as soon as... Uh... As soon as we know, we'll tell you. Um, we're that's exact. We're you know we're we're piggybacking on nanograv. You know every time they're observing. Um, so there are uh, parks. You know that that has been. There have been examples of that uh, in their timing experiments where they found FRBs. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what you know the the type of uh, observing that we would hope to uh, take advantage of. Okay. Um, and I think in the future, since the GBT plans to archive all these pulsar, like these all the data in the future, people can go back and look for things in the um, out of the data sets. Yeah, we um, like I said, we don't have the capacity to store uh, too much. Um, what we what we do is when when we find an interesting event, we will um, we will archive that nine minute data set and bring it back over here to Morgantown. Um, but yeah, it would be great to have, um, you know, a dedicated archive to look, you know, to, to go back and look from scratch, uh, with different algorithms in. Yeah. So data mining in the future might be a, mm -hmm. a good industry. Um, we have se several more questions. Will it be interesting to look into the MSP single pulses to link them with the FRBs, and I'm not sure what MSP. Yeah, that, that's, that's millisecond pulsars. Okay, millisecond pulsars. You see the millisecond pulsars are members of the Scottish Parliament. Um, so I'll, yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, that's a great question, though. Um, the One of the things that we'd like to do um, is look, because we have, you know, by by piggybacking on Nanograv, we have a lot of MSP single pulses sitting in our database. And so we would like to understand their um, amplitude distribution and burst rate, and so one of one of my students currently is is looking into that right now with the data that we have in hand. Um, they may not be a great um, source um, population for FRBs, however, this, there still is relatively unexplored in terms of what we know about their giant pulse distribution. We know that millisecond pulsars um, release giant pulses, but we um, we still have a lot to learn about them. So yeah, we're, that's one of the, the nice things we can do with this. Okay, um, you might have already sort of addressed this, but this is the universe just not making as many FRBs as initially thought, or does it need some major leap in detector technology to find more? Yeah, it, so when we published our initial paper, we said hundreds per day. Uh, and when the, the Parks paper came out, it said 10 to the 4 per day. Now it's somewhere in the middle, 1,000 per day. Uh, it depends, of course, on the, the detection threshold that you choose. But I think that's um, 
that's basically the number that we've that, that we've got and um it, it's really uh it's really a question of what can you do with the with the facilities that you have access to you know with gbt right now we just have the single pixel um but you know pretty decent sensitivity so we can do these um targets of opportunity um searches with it but we're never going to be able to compete with uh with chime uh as a detection machine i think we're uh so it it's it's more interesting for telescopes like green bank and fast also to 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 look at um frb repeaters i'm really interested in what the wideband receiver is going to be able to do for studies of repeating FRBs. I think that's going to be be very interesting. Um, and so, I'm, and I'm sure a lot of people on this call are thinking about that too. Yeah, um, we have a compliment. Nice talk. Do you know if you have significant exposure on galactic magnetars or high magnet, high B pulsars with green bursts? Uh, no, we don't. And that's really because, um, it hasn't, they, they, they haven't been looked at, um, terribly often with the GBT. So the, I should say one, one thing I didn't mention in the talk is that the observer who's, you know, primarily guiding the telescope, they have the option to turn us off. Um, and sometimes we do get switched off, and that's that's fine. You know, they they want to uh, to analyze analyze the data in a specific way, and they don't they don't want us interfering. Um, but um, there, and I think there's there's been a couple of specific uh, FRB and perhaps some magnetar follow ups that we've just been you know off the air for. Um, so, um, but while I have the the community on the line, you know, I, I would just like to underscore that we're very happy to work with people um, if we have any ideas or, you know, possible um, thoughts about further collaborations. You know, as I said, we, we hope to keep the system running for as long as it's feasible. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a low budget project that has a lot of potential. Hey, yeah, uh, we have several more questions that have been coming in. Do you think there's a need to include beaming fractions while getting pulse energies to make sure we do not overestimate things using isotropic energies and mistaken them for being giant pulses rather than just being being more towards us? Um, yeah, I mean, I just I I take it what the person saying there is correct. I take a very empirical view in this in that we are we are you know there's a variety of transient populations that we're talking about now pulsars frbs rats you know giant pulsing emitters and things like that I I I take the view that we're looking at this population the ones that are beaming towards us that we're seeing those amplitude distributions I'm interested in their you know the fluences that we can measure with the telescope um I, um, when, you know, when we try to fold all that, that in with, uh, let's say a population synthesis to underline, uh, to analyze the underlying source population, absolutely. We want to, uh, we want to make sure that we're putting in, um, appropriate assumptions about beaming. But the nice thing about, um, experiments like this is that you can often base event rates um expectations from previous experiments you know where you know where there's um similar empirical studies okay and a dispersion question here is the dispersion from psr bursts equal to that from normal timing pulsars or pulses excuse me um yeah so so if we're talking about pulsars in the milky way or just pulsars in general their dispersion is pretty dispersion measure is pretty much uh constant from pulse to pulse and so when we when we time them we we get the same dispersion measure as we see in single pulses um frbs you know have a more complex uh frequency time structure um intrinsically the, the repeating ones seem to seem to have uh if i just go back to the um the image here this is, you know, this is just the one that we saw, but there are there are other sources where we see um, what's what's known as downward drifting in the in, in multiple pulses across the band, 
um, even after you take uh, take out disper the the overall dispersion measure. And so there are there are some more complexities. But for just going back to pulsars, yeah, the um, the average pulse and the the single pulses have the same DM. Okay, another um, comment on your talk. Great talk. The VLA counterpart to Greenberg's V Light, and there's a V Light at .nra.edu web link. It's been running for ten years now, so this is more of a comment. Um, detects slower transients, but very similar in that it's a commensal system and that takes whatever happens to come in. Mm -hmm. And highlighting this is just a fun way to get the commensal. Uh, a plug for commensal systems in general. So there's one on the VLA as well. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate them bringing that up. It's, uh, uh, then, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sure whether that was still running. It's good to hear it's still going. Yep. Um, and do, there's a specific question on the uh, the period of the 2.2 second pulsar. Do you know the the de period derivative for that pulsar, the 2.2 second? Um, we will soon. Um, we. have we're collecting um, regular observations with Chime. Um, I uh, Joseph is just about to defend his PhD thesis, and so I've been trying to uh, make sure he uh, he just finishes his talk. And then, but once he's once he's defended next week, we're going to start looking at those data, and we should be able to measure the p dot. And then we have a comment about the FRB. It sort of looks like the giant pulse from the crab-like pulsar is a question. Do you think that there's a comparison there? Um, yeah, I, it's, I don't, I don't quite know what to make of it. It's uh, the the giant pulses from the crab, and, and I should have put another slide on here, but as, as far as I'm aware, the giant pulses from the crab don't have this sort of semi-regular spacing, um, but there are a number of um, chime uh, examples of, of bursts, you know, a few um, that have really well-defined uh, quasi-periodicities across the bursts. I should have should have added a, an image there that are really quite remarkable. And so it shows more similarities with those, I would say. Okay. And then um, I think that's the last question. So the FRB struct structure pulsars could originate from different regions of the source as a question mark. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's all bets are are off really at this point. Yeah. I, um, I, I, it's you know, another way to think about it might be different. Uh, let's say this is let's say this 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 putative periodicity that I'm um, just chalking up here, you know, is something to do with rotation. Then it's it's potentially what we're seeing are components coming from different rotational phases um, of a spinning object. Okay, I think we take in all the, the questions. Oh, I'll throw one in. Yeah. Um, in terms of the 20 meter, I the source distribution brightness, um, would you actually detect more with a uh, sensitive system on the 20 meter given the bigger beam than the GBT um, or? No, it doesn't. It. Uh, I see what you're saying. It, it, you, uh, you still win with the it, GBT. It, you still win with the GBT. With yeah, the source we, counts. Okay. We did a similar experiment with the 20 meter um, with Steve Ellingson a few years ago um, just to try to get blind detections. And it, yeah, the, the rate was just too low. Okay. No, I was just curious on that. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for a great talk and filling all the questions. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. So I think it's great whenever we can do these commensal projects and yeah. and have students to work on and stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Happy to get the chance to talk about it. Thanks. So um, this concludes our webinar for this week. Um, we'll have one in a couple of weeks. Mark Snelden's from Astron will be talking about the micro second duration burst from FRB um, 2012-1102A. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so anyway, until next time, everybody, thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.